Hello, welcome to Converging Dialogues. This is Xavier Bonilla. On this episode, I am honored to be talking with Grace Lindsay. Grace is a computational neuroscientist. And for those of you that don't know what that is, we get into it and we explain it, all about it. She has a bachelor's in neuroscience from the University of Pittsburgh. She has a PhD in neuroscience from the Center of Theoretical Neuroscience at Columbia University. She studied abroad in Germany, and she is currently at Sainsbury Wellcome Center, Gatsby Computational Neuroscience Unit at the University College in London. The reason we're talking today is that she has a new book out. It is released tomorrow, May 4th. And it is called Models of the Mind, How Physics, Engineering, and Mathematics Have Shaped Our Understanding of the Brain. Uh, I've read the book, and it's, it's out digitally, and, or it's been out digitally. And when I read the book, I was really excited to get her on and, and talk with her about the book and, and really talking about neuroscience from a, a different angle, right? Definitely from... Um, the a physics and engineering background and, and the importance of talking about that. We start the conversation by talking about what computational neuroscience is and what it isn't. We t- give a brief overview and review of neuroanatomy. And then we talk about some of the details that are in the book. We talk about action potentials and their comparisons with the electrical circuit We talk about the Hopfield network as a way to understand memory in the brain and how it's used for working memory and long-term memory. We talk about certain areas of how the hippocampus can function as a type of Hopfield network. We talk about early computer science research that helped in creating a model for visual sequencing. And then we talk about the future of computational neuroscience and some of the models that are um, used to help us understand many things and where the future of computational neuroscience is going. Grace was was such a lovely person to talk to. She's super brilliant, and you can really tell she has such a great passion for, for this field and for understanding the brain and neuroscience from different angles that are really important. And, um, you know, it's, it was just a real treat to be able to hear this side of neuroscience. Um, All of my training and the exposure I've I've had has obviously been from a physiological perspective. And so seeing it from the engineering mathematics side was super awesome. So I, I hope everyone else finds it just as awesome as I did. And now I bring you Grace Lindsay. I am here with Grace Lindsay. Grace, it's so nice to see you. Thank you for, for coming on and, and wanting to chat with me. Thank you for having me. Of course. You've written an awesome book um, that I'm excited to chat about. So before we get into it, just tell us who you are, uh, what you do, what you study, and you know any future projects you have in the works. Yeah, so I'm Grace Lindsay. Um, I am a computational neuroscientist, so I use math and computer models to study the brain. Um, I'm currently a postdoc at University College London at the Gatsby Computational Neuroscience Unit. Um, But before that, I got my PhD in theoretical neuroscience at Columbia University. Um, I got a bachelor's in neuroscience at University of Pittsburgh. And I also did a research fellowship um, before I started my PhD at the Bernstein Center in Freiburg, Germany. Um, So I've done computational neuroscience at a few different places. Um, and then also starting around when I started my PhD, I got into science communication. So mm-hmm. I started um, writing a blog and writing for different outlets. And I had a podcast for a few years in there as well. Um, and yeah, and then the most recent thing is I wrote, I wrote this book, Models of the Mind, which is my attempt to explain the field of computational neuroscience to people who may not have heard of it or have heard of it, but don't know a lot about it or even are in it, but don't know its history. Um, mm-hmm. because I didn't know most of what's in the book before I started writing it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No, that's great. Um, wow. I mean, that's super incredible. Like you've literally been doing neuroscience since kind of day one. I mean, you've, you're in it, uh, which is, it's nice to hear that you still learn stuff. Cause I mean, the brain is a crazy, crazy place. Uh, it's super awesome. But, um, when I worked with a neuropsychologist, he used to say, 
Oh yeah. The field changes every six months. Like every six months, there's something you learn a bunch of stuff and you're like, half of this doesn't work anymore. And then how do we learn this new stuff? And so it's always just like constant, like, you know, changing and evolving and growing and learning. So that's super awesome. Uh, so yes, models of the mind, right? Is that right? Yep. Um, great book. I've read it. I really enjoyed it. Um, and so that's what I, I want to chat about. Uh, before we get into the first part, why don't you tell me about uh, or explain a little bit about computational neuroscience? I think most people understand what neuroscience is, you know, folks that study the brain. But in terms of the computational neuroscience, just kind of give us a little bit more of, you know, what that is and um, how you uh, use that on a daily basis and chat about that a little bit. Yeah, so I think people are maybe more familiar with like computational or computational or the theoretical work when it comes to physics, like the idea that there are people who are physicists, but their job doesn't involve doing experiments. It involves like writing down equations or running code. Like people have that concept in yeah. their mind somewhat in the field of physics. And basically that just exists in a lot of different fields and neuroscience is one of them. And it's becoming even kind of a, a larger component of neuroscience and how we approach the brain, computational and theoretical theoretical methods, our um, funding agencies are in recent years kind of appreciating that uh, we need to think more about those kinds of approaches to the brain because it's so complex and there's so much data that we're collecting. So basically, I mean, there are many different um, approaches to studying the brain that fall under the umbrella of computational neuroscience. But the thing that connects them is usually just that you're using math or um, writing code kind of in a way that goes beyond the standard math you would use to do like a st statistical significance test in like a normal study. That's kind of a type of mathematical analysis that exists all over neuroscience and psychology. Computational methods usually are using either more advanced data analysis methods to try to get some signal out of all the you know neural activity that we're recording in the brain, or they are building models, which are kind of stand-ins for parts of the brain where you say, I think, you know, this neuron connects to that neuron and I'm going to write an equation that represents that. And then I'm going to study if I change the strength of that connection, what happens to the neural activity, that kind of thing. So really like making a clear analogy between the math that you're looking at and the brain, that would be the modeling side of it. And then yet yeah, the data analysis side is just more complex ways to look at the data that's collected. And as I said, these methods are becoming, you know, more popular even within the last several years. Yeah. Like I started in computational neuroscience, I guess I was partway through my undergrad when I learned about the computational side of neuroscience. And so that was like 2009. And so in the past 10 years that I've been interested in this field, I see kind of mainstream neuroscience um, adopting these methods more and more and kind of realizing the need for them more and more, especially as the methods that we have for collecting neural data increase such that we're getting thousands, um, hundreds of thousands potentially of neurons at a time that we're kind of listening to and getting the activity from while maybe an animal is doing a task or something like that. And you want to know how to relate that big you know, dump of neural activity with the behavior that the animal is producing, you can't just kind of look at those neurons and be like, oh yeah, I think that neuron does this or whatever. You need complex methods to understand how these, what these neurons are representing about the real world, how they do transformations, how they do computations. Um, so to basically be able to say how the brain produces behavior as it does. So yeah, computational neuroscience just is um, a broad definition or a broad field that includes many different types of mathematical approaches to try to understand the brain. No, oh, that's great. That's great. It, it sounds like it's very much anchoring something that we know in terms of the brain and, and neural activity to quantifiable methods and or uh, um, models of understanding how this neuron connects with this neuron or how these certain systems within the brain are connecting. So it's not just kind of out there in the ether <laughs> of, of, you know, hypotheses, but more of grounding it in actual mathematical formulas. So that way we can kind of hang our hat on some of these things. Yeah. I feel like, especially like the modeling side of it is it's a way to formalize a hypothesis. It's to mm. say like, this is exactly what I think. And um, it's true that, you know, People obviously hypothesize about how the brain works all the time. <laughs> Neuroscientists yeah. do it all right. the time. Right. Um, and they do it based on, you know, the data they, they've collected. But 
once you actually sit down and say, I need to write in code how I think this works, like mm-hmm. I need to put this, I need to like give a computer the steps by which I believe the brain is doing something or, you know, the instructions to build this part of the brain that the way I think it works. When you sit down and have to do that, you really realize all the holes in your understanding. Mm. Because if you have to like put a number to something, Mm -hmm. you know, you might think like, oh yeah, I think, you know, vaguely, yeah, this brain area connects to that brain area. And it's like, well, the actual strength and details of that connection, like when those vary, you can produce vastly different models that have vastly different behavior. And so it really is the case that building mathematical models, again, not just in neuroscience, but in any field, forces you to actually uh, think about what you think. Like, Mm -hmm. I think I have an idea of how this works, but when you have to say it in a language as precise as mathematics, that's when you're really coming up against the wall of what you know and what you don't know and what, you know, fuzzy idea actually can be turned into something concrete and which one is just fuzzy and that's kind of the end of it. Mm -hmm. Um, So yeah, there's a, a quote I use in the book from can't remember if it was Whitehead or Bertrand Russell, the famous mathematicians that is like, uh, something is, you never realize how vague something is until you try to make it precise. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Like you Mm -hmm. can't know until you sit down and and try to build the model. Um, yeah, which is why I'm very happy that, um, neuroscience is coming around to to Mm -hmm. embracing these kinds of models because the brain is very complicated Mm -hmm. and it's easy to delude yourself to think that maybe you've got a hold on it unless you really test out that idea. Yeah, no, absolutely. That's great. That's great. Um, so I guess just to tee us up, why did you want to, why did you want to write a kind of a more popularized uh, book? I know you said science communication uh, earlier ago, but did, you know, why did you want to write this book of kind of detailing how math and physics uh, help us understand, you know, neuroscience? And um, I guess what was that motivation for, for doing that as, as well? this isn't an insult. And I don't mean it that way, but you know, a lot of times when people are doing kind of like formulas and stuff, they're not the best writers. It's a little very like, kind of like, you know, stale and you know, it's not so great, but the book is well-written too. It's very good. So it's very readable. I think, um, you know, you, there's a lot of like, almost like, it, it feels like almost like narratives, right? There's all these stories about how these things come to be, which kind of makes it much more an enthralling read, right? Cause you're like, Oh, you're just kind of reading a story of uh of how this came to be so it's 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 great in that way as well so but how did you get to 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 write the book or want to write it yeah so it was it was my experience being in the field that if i went to like a party that had people who weren't in neuroscience, which was actually kind of rare because (laughs) when you're doing a PhD in neuroscience, a lot of the people you know are neuroscientists. Um, (laughs) But on those occasions where I would get out of my bubble and someone would ask me what I do, if I said computational neuroscience, like there was no follow-up question because (laughs) people didn't want to just say like, what is that? (laughs) So it was clear to me that this is not an area that a lot of people know about. And as I said, even when I started in it, it wasn't, it didn't read to me as an area that a lot of neuroscientists, like a lot of the experimental neuroscientists really knew about or appreciated um, kind of all, all the interactions that have happened between physics and math and neuroscience. And so I wanted to write a book that was readable by a general audience to just like tell them this field exists and it's actually doing a lot of cool things. Mm -hmm. And not only that, but I think this is honestly like how we're going to understand the brain in the future. Like Mm -hmm. these are the approaches that we're going to need to use. And there's a lot of popular science books about how the brain works, but they tend to, you know, they don't talk about mathematical models most of the time. They are focused more on kind of maybe uh, like large scale ideas about this brain area does that and, you know, stuff like that, that is a much more simplified view and reflects, you know, trends in research that have occurred um, in the past few decades. But I felt like, um, one, there was already actually a long history of mathematical methods being influential in neuroscience, even if people didn't recognize kind of where their ideas came from. So I wanted to highlight that with like, as you said, the histories of how things came about, but then I just kind of also wanted to share with people the, the way that, um, we're understanding the brain today. And because I do think it is really powerful to put things into a mathematical model and then be able to test it and run simulated experiments and all these kinds of things. And, Like when I first learned about computational neuroscience, because I started 
my undergraduate degree as a neuroscience major, but kind of explicitly (laughs) anti-computational because (laughs) I didn't actually know what computational neuroscience was myself. And I was had a confused understanding of what it was. And I thought, "Eh, that sounds silly. I'm going to, you know, work in a lab. I'm going to try to study, you know, really neurobiology um, and like get my hands dirty in experiments and stuff. But when I found out what computational neuroscience was and how it's a way of kind of piecing together all the different types of data that we have into like coherent models of how the brain functions. I was like, okay, yeah, this makes a lot of sense. This is very powerful. We can bring tools from other fields in and use it to try to understand the brain. Um, and so, yeah, I just, I, I think it's interesting and exciting. And yeah, as you said, kind of mathematical things don't usually come across as interesting and exciting or have like good narratives to them. But like, it was clear to me that all those pieces were there and I just needed to like present them to the public in the right way so that they could have the enthusiasm that I have as someone who's working in the field. Yeah, no, I mean, you, 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 you knock it out the park for sure in the book. So it's, it's great. Um, so let's do just a, a brief kind of a primer uh, overview of neuroanatomy just to help listeners kind of be in that headspace and then we can talk about some of the specific uh really chapters or or where you touch on some of these things how do you typically for people that you know everyone knows what the brain is but how do you when you're trying to to explain the brain a little bit more in terms of sections and how it works how do you usually do it? i have a way of which i do it but how do you how do you usually do it well, there is kind of a stereotype or joke that is mostly true, which is that computational people don't know much about neuroanatomy. Because, uh-huh. Uh-huh. You know, in your models, you can have neurons connect to each other, but you don't care how they're physically laid out in the brain. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Whereas it's very relevant to experimentalists, of course, where okay. the brain area they're studying is. Right. <laughs> right, right, right. So, yeah, I don't have uh, like a set way that I would normally explain um, neuroanatomy, mm-hmm. uh, just aside from kind of going through the main you know, areas that are of relevance to much of modern neuroscience. Yeah, I think normally this would work well with visuals and, mm-hmm. and uh, you know, the the professor in me is coming out now and wanting to like kind of teach and everything. But uh, the way I do it is I usually start and say like, you know, as, as, uh, as humans, we're um, vertebrates, right? So we have a brain, we have a spinal cord, central nervous system, we have a peripheral nervous system. So all the nerves and it's a lot of information gathering and, and, and spelling out. <clears throat> and I usually start with the, so the bottom of the, uh, the top, excuse me, of the spinal cord, bottom of the brain is um, the brain stem, which has hindbrain, midbrain, forebrain. So it's kind of developed into three areas, which is um, responsible for many different things. You know, it's kind of the reflex kind of things, you know, sneezing, coughing, consciousness, dreaming, or wanting to go to sleep, kind of just the involuntary stuff. Um, and then the forebrain starts peeking into the what's called subcortical and then the cortical parts of the brain. Subcortical is stuff which is the basal ganglia and amygdala and hippocampus and the limbic system, um, which are all different things in different parts for memory, emotion, um, kind of the executive functioning. So planning, sequencing, organizing of movement. And then you get to cortical, so the top of the brain, and you have the four lobes. So you have the occipital lobe in the back, which is mostly responsible for vision. You have the um, temporal lobes, responsible for storage of memory and uh, audition or auditory um, aspects of of, uh, uh, stimulus. And then you have temporal lobes kind of at the top uh, for somatosensory, so how we have our senses, proprioception, how we have our space and uh, understand of our, our way in space. And then the prefrontal cortex and frontal lobes, which have all the fun stuff, right? It's abstraction, it's executive functioning. So planning, organizing, sequencing of many different things, um, directions. If you have orbital frontal, which is for like social cognition. You have, you know, many other parts to it. Um, obviously language is more of the less left hemisphere. Um, and then you have the, the two hemispheres, which is left and right hemisphere for different parts, corpus callosum is right down the middle. Uh, yeah, I think that's that's the long and short of it. There's many, 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 many other parts. I think the biggest thing with the brain is that there's for a long time, there was this kind of fascination of like, this part does this and this part does this. And that is true. But what we know about the brain now is that the brain is always... Um, in sync or intent, well, not always, but it's in sync or in tandem on how it works and does things. So memory is not just in the hippocampus, right? That's usually a consolidation of memory from short-term to long-term. 
um, but you have the storage of it and the temporal lobes. But then there's like uh, memories involved, um, in learning and memory are involved with uh, kind of motoric functions in the cerebellum, right? Which we didn't know for a long time. And then it was like, oh, we can do that. That's also there. So there's a lot of like overlap, right? Different areas of the brain are are doing different parts. And so, it, or, or different stuff in different parts. So one aspect of it would be also that we have in the brain areas where we're able to say, oh, if you have lesions or you have significant atrophying, right? So literally your brain is dissipating. Well, then your brain compensates and you're able to pick it up in another part of the brain, right? And it's able to do that in various studies that show that. So that's at the kind of uh, anatomy of it. And then we get down to the neurons. Um, how's that? Anything you want to add to that? Is that, is that about right? Yeah, I would just say it is uh, just a reflection on that. The idea of, you know, we used to kind of think of this brain area does this and they all had separate functions and stuff. Um, and now we understand a more nuanced uh, version of it. It's just, it's a reflection to me of kind of, uh, yeah, or it's a, a question that I have about kind of, does science always have to go that way where you have like a, a simplified view that's potentially so simplified that it's wrong. And then yeah. you add nuance, but having that simplified view helped you get along the way enough to add the nuance because this is something that comes up in modeling of course because you mm -hmm. you don't build a perfect re replica of the thing you're modeling you choose the features that are relevant and the ones that you want to highlight and many times you knowingly ignore a lot of the details to be able to build a model that you can work with um so yeah it's just interesting that you know we, yeah when we look back it's like oh yeah the idea that you know functions were so um localized to different regions you know that seems silly of course but then at the same time if if we didn't think about it that way where would we be now would we be able to have a better understanding you know mm -hmm. if we just started by thinking that everything was connected and all did all uh, the jobs <laughs> no, no no that's that's a really good point that's a really really good point actually because it's kind of like working bottom up right in some ways it's like okay well let's start here a lot of this is localized here but it's not just there. And so, you know, as it goes, right, people get really attached to their whole, like, you know, ways of understanding things. And it's like, well, wait a minute, I mean, it's not entirely true. And it, it is, but it's not the whole story. And so I think that's really important. So I think in uh, the second chapter of the book, I, I, um, you had, uh, you started talking about the story of an action potential. So I remember reading this, and I was like, oh, it's brought me back to physio. I was like, oh, I haven't thought about an action potential in that way in a long time. Mm -hmm. um, it's kind of like the basics of how we understand uh, kind of neurons. So maybe just, you know, you, you tell us the, again, the overview of what an actual potent, action potential is, but more so um, kind of what you do with almost every chapter in the book is it's not, okay, there's things we know about many of these things. But what you're the story you're telling is how are there certain computational models that got us to that point? So maybe just kind of give us the overview of what an action potential is and then kind of give us the 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 part that you tell us about. Yeah. So an action potential is, you know, considered in neuroscience kind of the main moment of interest in what a neuron does. Um, it's how a neuron sends signals to other neurons. Um, and so what it really is, is kind of a uh, disturbance in the balance of charges in a neuron's membrane. Mm -hmm. um, and you can record that by putting an electrode near or inside the neuron, and you can pick up these changes in current. Um, and yeah, when that happens, so what causes an action potential is that a neuron gets input from other neurons um, that changes uh, the electrical properties of the cell. And if it gets enough of those, it reaches a threshold, then it has an action potential, which allows this electrical signal to go out to all the ends of the neuron um, through its axons. And mm -hmm. then that neuron releases neurotransmitter to cause other neurons to have their own action potentials. And so because it's how neurons communicate, it's considered very important. <laughs> um, yeah. Neurons communicating is basically how things get done in the brain. <laughs> um, so yeah, so that's why it's uh, of interest and important to understand what an action potential is and how it works. And it is, um, it, it's one of the earliest examples of like concrete mathematical modeling in neuroscience. Um, and the way that it worked was, I mean, originally, long time ago, um, mm -hmm. people didn't know that neurons used electricity. 
uh, that they didn't know that the body used electricity for communication. Mm -hmm. And so um, that was the, the discovery of that is attributed to um, a man called Galvani, mm -hmm. uh, which is why we have the word galvanized uh, mm -hmm. and uh, a Galvan, Gal, I don't know how to pronounce it actually, the galvanometer uh, uh -huh. Uh -huh. that yeah. uh, we use to record current in, in uh, neurons. Um, but yeah, so he discovered, the story is he discovered on accident um, in his laboratory at home with his wife, Lucia, that uh, electricity, if you apply electricity to a frog's leg, it'll cause the leg to twitch. Uh, and so from there on, he started studying this concept of bioelectricity and electricity in the body and what the body uses it for. And um, I go into the book about the back and forth where like people didn't believe him for a while, but eventually mm -hmm. people came to accept that, yes, electricity is used. And then the question is kind of how does this action potential, which is this kind of electrical disturbance, how does the neuron actually create that? What are the mechanisms? Right. And for that, um, the mathematical modelers used the mathematics of electricity because you mm -hmm. can, you know, see electricity at play in neurons. And so the thought was neurons, in, in, an individual neuron is like a mini electrical circuit. And so we can use the same concepts um, of electrical circuits to explain neurons. Yep. And so that means that you can think of the uh, membrane of a neuron, the like cell membrane of it as a capacitor because mm -hmm. it keeps charged particles separated. So the charged particles in this case are ions, mostly of sodium and potassium. And um, if you keep those separated, you have this you know, uh, separation of charge that is voltage. And in the case of an action potential, uh, what happens is that the channels in the membrane open, which changes the resistance of, in this electrical circuit so that it allows different ions to pass through it and therefore allows charge to, uh, to flow. Mm -hmm. And so you can use the same equations like Ohm's law and things like that that we use to write down when we want to build electrical circuits Neuroscientists use those every day to model neurons and their action potentials and to be able to say, you know, in what way will input to this neuron turn into an action potential? What will be the exact details of the action potential based on the ion channels that the neuron has and how they affect resistance in uh, the neuron membrane? Uh, so, yeah, that's that the first um, use of electrical circuit as an analogy for a neuron in this explicit mathematical way was uh, Louis Lepic in 1907. Mm -hmm. uh, he made a very simple, uh, what we call an equivalent circuit model. So a circuit a model of a circuit that's meant to represent what a neuron does. And then the really famous one that like kind of all neuroscientists have to learn about and know about is the Hodgkin Huxley model. And that didn't come until the fifties. Um, mm -hmm. And this is the one that really gives you like a detailed picture of how the action potential works and how different ion channels in uh, the neuron membrane are responsible for different components of the shape of an action potential. Yeah. And I think it's also really helpful to understand that, you know, that story is really important in, in how we can, we can see how different fields aren't so different, right? that there is a lot of overlap and that there is this um, crossing or overlap of saying, well, we can take things from one field and how we understand electrical currents and we can just apply that here in the brain and how, how that happens. Um, uh, just, just for listeners sake, my understanding is that, you know, from the cell, you know, and it's going down the axon, there's this process of it going from electrical to then chemical, right? And then when it gets chemical, then it you know goes into the synapse, goes to the next nerve. But you need both in tandem. But understanding things about um, electrical aspects from another field helps us to understand more about the brain. And uh, you, I mean, it depends maybe on the school. You might get some version of that, but not in the way that you told the story, which I think is really helpful. Um, what is, I guess, in this way, you know, what's one way in which we can kind of see this, you know, you had mentioned that, you know, neuroscientists use this every day, you know, what's a way in which this is helpful to kind of have this overlap of kind of different fields or different disciplines kind of working in tandem? How, how do we see this in a positive way play out? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, I mean, one thing I would say about that general idea is that um, 
neuroscientists, because we knew for a while that you could use electricity to control the brain or the body, like in the early days of being a neurophysiologist, you had to understand things about electricity. Mm -hmm. And so it made sense that the people who were studying the nervous system also knew things about how to build electrical circuits and what the Mm -hmm. basic components of them are. And so I think the analogy there was kind of you know, one of the easier ones to make just because you would assume that the people doing the work are educated in both sides of those things. And it's just about kind of applying the knowledge to uh, one side to the other. A lot of the examples later in the book are things that are very separate and it takes someone from a totally different field to come into neuroscience and be like, hey, this looks like this other thing I know. But in this case, it was kind of straightforward to to think of the neuron as doing the same things that the electrical circuits that you use to study the neuron are doing. Um, But yeah, I think it's, I mean, it can be beneficial in a lot of ways in kind of an abstract way. It's just beneficial because it, you know, injects new ways of thinking into a field, which can be helpful to just have people kind of come in and make these analogies and let one field influence another. Um, It can be helpful just for kind of freshening things up and um, giving people new tools to study things or new lenses through which to view what they're doing. In the case of being able to write a, um, a an equation that says what a neuron does, like when a neuron will fire based on the inputs that it gets, which is what you can do with these um, equivalent circuit models. Being able to do that just means now you can have a mathematical model of a neuron. <laughs> and that's the basis for like right. so much of computational neuroscience that you have these individual models of how neurons take in their input and how that leads to an action potential. And then you just let them connect to each other. And so now you have model neurons that are sending their outputs to become inputs to other model neurons. And now you can, you know, build up a whole brain area, a whole, you know, model of many, many cells um, and see how they interact and put in more constraints that you have from the data. Say like, you know, we have different cell types that have different um, properties in terms of how they produce action potentials. And we can, you know, fit that with the electrical circuit model. And then we can say those cell types connect to each other more than they connect to other cell types. And you can just start adding in all of the details that you want, just based on this foundation, which says neurons are small electrical circuits that interact with each other. Yeah. And and I think to your point here about the modeling of it is like, well, we can't extract live neurons, I don't believe from a person's brain. Um, So having an electrical circuit is a kind of externalization of that. And then you can get to, you know, practice on those things. I mean, it's not a a complete one to one, obviously, but there's enough things there to say, oh, and so when you're trying to find, you know, different solutions to different problems, at the you know cellular level, you know there's some I would say advantages to to being able to have this externalization based on how we understand kind of the circuits and how they work. Yeah, you can definitely do experiments in a simulated neural circuit that you can't do in a real neural circuit for sure. <laughs> right. right um, yeah. People do you know take neurons out of um, animals and like grow them in a dish and try sure. to kind yeah. of have some control over how they grow, which is like the closest thing you can get to a computer simulation in a real lab. <laughs> um, but right. yeah, no, having the actual ability to do the computer simulation. Um, to, again, to explicitly state and also test hypotheses. Mm -hmm. Like, I think that this neuron fires this way because it has these kinds of ion channels and I'm going to represent those in my model with, you know, a resistance term in the electrical circuit. And then you can say, okay, yes, it does have these firing properties as a result because different neurons in the brain fire differently. Some of them will like have one action potential when they get enough input. Some, if you give them enough input, they have a burst where they have a bunch of action potentials all in a row. And so there are these things that need explaining in the neurobiology of like, why do different neurons behave differently? Mm -hmm. And so having the ability to build different types of neurons in mathematical equations lets you, lets you figure out kind of what is the cause of different behaviors. And that's, I I think that is kind of one of the most concretely successful applications of um, mathematical models that has impacted kind of neuroscience rather broadly Um, because when I was an undergraduate and I was getting a neuroscience degree that was mostly um, the other students in it were pre-meds. They weren't trying Mm. to go on to do a PhD in neuroscience like I was. Um, So the the, uh, curriculum was kind of skewed towards basic biology and chemistry and that kind of thing. But we did have to take a neurophysiology course where we learned the Hodgkin-Huxley equation. Um, And so most neuroscientists, even ones who think that like computational modeling hasn't done much for neuroscience, If you ask them, like, well, what do you think of Hodgkin Huxley? It's kind of like, well, that's just how an action potential works. (laughs) It's like almost not thought of as a mathematical model. It's just the answer to the question of how is an action potential generated (laughs) through this process. But, you know, 
we yeah. needed to write it down in math to to check it. And I also actually there's um a, another quote in the book that I like from um Huxley, who in uh, describing this period where they were building these mathematical models and testing them, um, they had to use a hand crank calculator to uh, to do the math of it. So they'd kind mm -hmm. of run through their equations, get outputs, put those outputs back into the equations to get like the next time point, you know, what the voltage of the neuron would be. And they were trying to see if their model would create a trace of voltage that looks like the data. Um, and he was even saying that uh, in doing that, he would get kind of excited because he'd be like, okay, is this one going to turn into an action potential? And he'd think, oh yeah, it looks like it is. And he would like in his mind, you know, bet that it, this uh, simulation was going to be an action potential, but then it would like fade away because the neuron didn't get enough input and stuff. And just this idea that even the simplest thing about neurons in some way, the action potential, like the base unit for how we understand everything, even that process is so complex that you can't really just intuit how it works. Like you need to go through the yeah. math and you need to have the concrete yeah. mathematical equation to be able to say like, would a neuron like this fire in this circumstance? Absolutely. Yeah, no, I mean, that's, again, that's, uh, that's exactly uh, the big, that was one of the big takeaways I took from the book overall was just like, oh yeah. Like we kind of have to have like, something to write down about it. We can't just be like, yeah, it happens and exists. It's like, yeah, well, we know it happens. Right. Or, you know, but we have to know like concretely how it happens. Right. We can't just be on a, on, on a hypothesis or on, on a, on a wish here. Right. So I think that's the, that's the utility of it. Yeah. I like to think of it as experiments tell us what happens in the brain and models can tell us how and why yeah, those things nice. happen. Yeah. Yeah. So let's, uh, obviously we can't go through the whole book and I want people to buy it and read it. So, you know, this will be hopefully a nice, nice teaser for, for folks. Uh, but at least two more areas. So memories are pretty important. Um, and you write about this, um, in the book and, uh, particularly, I think you make the example of, let me get this right. Is it, um, Hopfield network and then trying to understand how that's connected to memories. And so maybe just tell us again, your kind of angle of how you look at the computational side of understanding what we know about memories and memories. I should uh, state at the top here that you know, memory is very complicated. Memory <laughs> is a lot of stuff. I mean, it is, it is a lot. I mean, it's a lot to learn about it. There's different types of memory and, and when it goes wrong, it doesn't go wrong the same way. Um, and even on the neuropsych piece of it, you know, anytime I would do neuropsych assessments, given a, 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 the, the biggest one, the extra memory scale, you know, is like 20 subtests, you know, it's like, there's so many and there's like, it's so much, it's so overwhelming. So tell us, memory's complicated. There's a lot of things going on in memory. Tell us what your kind of angle was and the story you wanted to tell about the computational side of how we understand memory in, in the brain. Yeah. Um, so yes, I definitely agree. It's very complicated. And as with all modeling, uh, this one simplifies it a lot <laughs> for the sake <laughs> of being able to do something. Um, yeah. So uh, as you said, the main uh, framework for understanding memory in computational neuroscience is something called the Hopfield Network. Uh, and it's named after John Hopfield, who was a physicist. Uh, actually, both his parents were physicists as well. So he was like very much ingrained in physics as a way of understanding the world. Uh, and so he got a PhD in physics and and was, you know, studying um, concepts in physics before he kind of felt like there wasn't much left for him to do there, which was like pretty quick after he got his PhD. Um, he decided that he wanted to kind of look around to see where else uh, his talents could be applied. Uh, and he got kind of steered towards biology first by studying hemoglobin. Um, and then eventually he like attended a meeting with some neuroscientists and uh, kind of heard the way that they were discussing the brain and he was interested in the question, but thought that their approach to it was wrong because it was not mathematical. And obviously coming from physics, you have to mathematize things if you're going to yes. actually be saying anything. <laughs> yes. Um, so yeah, so this is, this is kind of in a way um, like a poster child of what a lot of computational neuroscience has been in the past few decades, which is someone from physics or math or computer science possibly. Uh, who's kind of raised very purely in that discipline. And mm -hmm. then, you know, after their PhD, they decide to to look over at neuroscience and be like, hey, 
you guys, you guys need some cleaning up over there and I'm the one who can do it. Um, which is kind of in which they love. They love that. They love that. <laughs> no one's annoyed by that at all. Um, <laughs> but, uh, this is kind of in contradiction to the earlier days of computational neuroscience, where it was a lot more people who were just kind of trained both in mathematical things and in biology, just because, that's how things were, you know, back in the day, everything was kind of more mixed together and you usually got an education that was um, more kind of cross-disciplinary as we would say today, there just weren't strong disciplinary lines then. But yeah, so more modern uh, computational neuroscience in terms of like in the eighties and nineties and stuff is um, people coming from a mathematical field looking over in, into neuroscience. And then now today we train people in computational neuroscience directly. Um, so there's been an evolution there. Um, but yeah, so Hopfield, sees, you know, what people are doing over in neuroscience and wants to apply what he knows about physical modeling and, um, the, the side of, or the, the area in physics that he's drawing from is called the Ising model, which is used mostly to understand how different particles interact with each other. Mm. So, uh, if you have, um, a block of iron, the atoms in there are each kind of their own magnetic dipoles. And if the iron is very hot, those dipoles are moving around a lot, which means that they're pointing in different directions. And so the block of iron as a whole is not magnetic because they're all canceling each other out. Mm -hmm. But as you cool the iron down, uh, the magnetic uh, forces that these individual atoms are generating, they start to influence each other and align. So their interactions um, kind of force all of the atoms to be aligned the same way so that you create something that is magnetic on the macro scale. So this idea, which maybe it's not obvious how it's related to the brain yet, it's basically the idea that small individual units that can exert influence on each other can kind of create interesting macroscopic properties. Hmm. And the way that Hopfield applied that to the brain was to say, well, neurons are individual units that have influence on each other because when a neuron is active, it sends its connections to other neurons and those neurons become active or inactive depending on the type of connection. Mm -hmm. And so you can use this kind of model to model neurons and how they interact as well. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's basically what he did to try to understand how you could have a model where if you give it a small input, like you activate some of the neurons in a certain pattern, the interactions between the neurons will work in such a way that they recreate a larger pattern. Mm -hmm. And that that is memory in this model um, because it's <laughs> like, you know, you say something to someone and it reminds them of something they did last week or whatever. You put in this small thing and it recreates a full memory. So that was kind of the aspect of memory that he was focused on and capturing in this model. Um, and he was able to do this successfully. He was able to build these Hopfield networks where you connect neurons up in a certain way. And when you put in a little bit of a pattern, the, in the connections will recreate a pattern and an individual network like this can store multiple memories. So you can put in different small bits of patterns and they will recreate the right larger patterns. Um, and I mean, the, the kind of most interesting thing about this, which uh, made it relevant to neuroscientists, um, aside from the fact that, you know, his attempt here was to describe memory, but it's that the way that you learn what, like what neuron should connect to what other neuron and how strong that connection should be, the way that you do that in this network matches the kind of dominant theory of how neurons encode memories in the brain. And mm. that's what's known as heavy in learning, which is just to say that uh, neurons that are active together, their connections get stronger. So it's often mm. said as neurons that fire together, wire together. So if two <laughs> neurons are active, then they should have like, if, if over the course of many experiences in your life, two neurons are frequently active at the same time, they should have a strong connection. And neurons that uh, one is active and the other isn't most of the time, then they should have a weak or in this model negative connection. And so what that will do is it'll mean that, you know, let's say I am very used to walking into my house and uh, seeing the place where I put my keys and right now seeing like the place where I keep my mask. Um, <laughs> right. And uh, so the neurons that represent uh, the place where I put my keys and the place where I put my mask, they are active together a lot because every time I walk in, I see those two things. Mm -hmm. And so them being active together a lot means they'll have a strong connection. So next time when I think about 
the place where I put my keys, that strong connection will activate the neuron that represents my mask. And so now that experience of seeing that over and over has created a memory that has been kind of implanted in the connections between neurons. And so this was the theory of how it worked in the brain and the Hopfield network showed that you could do that in an actual model. Yeah, no, it's, 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 it's fascinating because there's an element of understanding that model for how we understand at a neuronal level about associative learning. And then also from, it seems as if it's going from some type of short-term to long-term memory. Um, now, I don't know if the model is used for all forms of memory, right? Because we have perspective memory, episodic memory, we have, you know, all these different types of memory, but is it mostly for this kind of short-term and or short-term to long-term memory, or is it, can the model be applied for all types of memory? What's the extent of the model? So I think the model that I just described is probably um, more akin to kind of how long-term memories are stored in that you okay. assume that the connections between neurons are developing over a long period of time, and then you can reactivate them. But this general framework is also used to explain working memory. Mm. Um, and that's because the Hopfield network, the kind of mathematical word for what's going on there is that the memories are attractors. So that means that the, the pattern of certain neurons being active um, altogether, that kind of pattern of neural activity is something that the network kind of wants to go to if it's given mm. the right inputs. That's mm. what it means for it to be an attractor state. Uh -huh. um, and so... Uh, that explains why when you give a little bit of input, it will go to this full memory state. But then the flip side of an attractor is that uh, it's stable, which means that once it's in that state, it'll stay there. And so working memory, which is what uh, sometimes it's kind of conflated with short term memory, but it's just the idea that right. you have something in your mind, like the, you can hold. What you're, yeah, that you can hold in your mind, like what you're planning to do. A lot of the times the example is like, if someone's giving you a phone number, you can right. like hold it in your mind before you write it down. That's working memory. And so because these attractor states are stable, meaning that once the neural activity is in that attractor state, it kind of stays in that state. These models can also explain working memory because the point of working memory is that you get into some state in, of your neural activity that represents what you're thinking about. And the goal is to just keep that there until you need to use that information. And so, uh, yeah, these, these attractor based models can explain elements of working memory as well. Yeah. And my first impulse there is to say like, well, it would be, I would imagine that a, uh, there's research if you're using this model on hippocampal volume and, or how the connections, not necessarily volume, but how the, how the neurons in the hippocampus are working because the hippocampus, again, back to the beginning here is, you think of the brain, it's at the very center of the brain, the subcortical region, in the, in, in, and it has this way of doing this transfer of working memory to long-term memory. And so much of working memory, not all, but much of working memory has its kind of home base in the hippocampus. And um, so I would imagine that this model could be applied by looking at those regions of the brain and understanding how neurons function in the hippocampus and, you know, you can think about it in terms of other things, right? In terms of, you know, for example, is that well-cited uh, um, piece of information about, you know, 15 minutes of like high extreme chronic stress causes hippocampal neurons to die, right? You know, there's the element of stress on the brain. And so I wonder if this like kind of this, how you're talking about the model, it's like, oh, well, we can understand with formulas, mathematical formulas about how the neurons are functioning in this part of, of the brain. So you could, I would Im imagine the model could help on the localized part, but then also even the more globalized part as well. Is that about right? Or Yeah. Yeah. So people definitely think of, so in the hippocampus, you have multiple regions, but people think yes. of an area called CA3 mm -hmm. as being kind of like a hot field network. Like it's ah, got neurons cool. that are very strongly interconnected and yeah. it seems like it's capable of forming these attractors. Ah. And so, as you said, there's this kind of transition from kind of short-term to long-term memory that happens. And it's believed that that happens by having the hippocampus kind of store the short-term memory and replay it out to the rest of the brain and to the cortex um, uh, 
particularly while sleeping, this seems to happen. Yeah, yeah. And then that gives the opportunity for the neurons in the other parts of the brain, like in the cortex, to undergo their own heavy and plasticity and encode mm -hmm. the memory themselves. And then mm -hmm. that's now becoming more of a long-term memory. Mm -hmm. So it does seem like you have this localized region in the hippocampus that could be functioning as something like a hot field network to be able to form these kind of quick attractor states so that it can hold the memory so that it can like teach the rest of the brain the memory uh, over the course of days or however long it takes. I love it. I love it. It's awesome. <laughs> it's so cool. Uh, okay. Briefly, let's, I mean, you can't really do this briefly, but <laughs> we'll try. Um, tell us about um, sight. Um, vision is one of the most uh, complex things, I think, in the human brain. Uh, I think even from an evolutionary perspective, it's super crazy how the eye has developed and evolved. Um, and I think the story in the book is about MIT in the early sixties. And even before we had like computers and stuff, so like they were, we were trying to, at least in the way that we had a more kind of, um, uh, in a popularized way, um, that there was a, there was a, a model there to tell us how we understand sight, uh, just for, um, one quick reminder for listeners is that the primary way of it's very complicated, but when we take things into our eyes and we, we view them, it goes all the way to the back of the head, right? All the way to the occipital lobe. There's a whole process for this. And we have so many, what we call visual streams in the brain, right? There's a kind of currents or highways, or if you will, and they're all doing different things. We have, of the three cranial nerves, right? Uh, three of them, or excuse me, of the 12 cranial nerves, three of them are for vision, at least for the movement around the, the, the eye socket. I mean, like vision is complex in the brain. So tell us the, the story that you wanted to focus on um, and that part of the book about uh, vision and sight and everything. Yeah, so vision is interesting because more than certain other areas, um, it, it's been the goal of people in a variety of fields and industries to have kind of an artificial visual system. Like it's just kind of obviously mm -hmm. useful to be able to automate the process of like looking for or monitoring or identifying things. <clears throat> yeah. um, and so there's been this pressure from well outside of neuroscience to understand vision, like computer science wants to understand vision because yeah. there's so many use cases for automating um, visual processing. And, um, yeah, it is this very complex process in the brain, but in the early days of computer science, there was an assumption that it was a straightforward problem <laughs> because to <laughs> us, like you look around and you see things like, how hard is it? You know, <laughs> it all just happens so automatically. Um, so yeah, in the sixties, there was this, um, attempt to essentially build a, a computer that could see that could like take in an image and label objects in it and describe the scene that it's seen. And the, um, hope was that this would be accomplished by like a group of students over a summer. That was, there's this um, memo uh, from the, that was stating this goal, you know, at the start of the summer in 63 or whenever it was. Um, and so that was very, very misguided. <laughs> <laughs> they did not create an artificial visual system um, because it, it takes the brain a lot to see. There are many, many areas of the brain that are, at least associated, if not primarily dedicated to uh, visual processing, especially in the primate brain, because it's kind of yeah. a dominant sense for, for primates. Um, so yeah, but so this, this back and forth between computer science and the, the biology of vision has just made it one of the areas where modeling has been pretty influential for a long time. Um, and it kind of goes in, in waves of like, there's a period where, you know, people on the artificial vision side make some progress that neuroscientists and then like, oh, maybe that is how the brain works. We can kind of think about that. Uh, and then sometimes it's clear that they're kind of working towards different goals and they don't communicate as much the two sides. Um, but yeah, so the uh, one of the historical ways of thinking about how vision worked uh, is this template matching idea, which basically just says that in your brain, you have all these templates that tell you how things look. Like if I'm looking at a picture of this person's face, like this is the light pattern that will hit my eye. And so if I see this light pattern, I match it up with the template and I say, okay, yeah, that's that person. 
And then I have different templates for all different people. And so whenever anything comes into my eye, I compare the pattern of light that is coming into my eye with my different templates. And I find, you know, who it is or what it is. Um, the reason that that's not a good way to do vision um, is because even if you had, you know, one of those for every person that you know, that's already a lot of templates for the brain to somehow store. It's not even clear, like how the brain stores templates. Um, and then on top of that, uh, if you just have different lighting, the person's wearing a different shirt, you know, any variation, they're standing at a different distance to you than they were the last time you saw them. Any variation at all will mean that the pattern of light that's hitting your eyes is very different. It can be incredibly different for the same object. Um, and so having a template for each possible variation in addition to each possible object is basically impossible. Yeah. Um, so template matching in its most basic form uh, wouldn't work but people did try to build artificial visual systems that did that. Um, and it works, you know, if you only have a limited set of things that you're looking for and they have pretty clear features that will be there, we're kind of independent of the exact lighting and all of that. Um, so it was okay in artificial vision for a bit. Um, but are you saying that Wittgenstein was wrong this whole time? He was completely wrong, right? <laughs> <laughs> he did a lot of the visual stuff with uh, particularly with language. Uh, which is always interesting. And so analytical philosophers love Wittgenstein. I I like Wittgenstein too, but um, it, it sort of makes sense. I mean, when we think about the templates thing, it's like, yeah, I could see that. But then when you start really thinking about it, it's like, well, we can't do that for everything, right? Yeah. I mean, it's just impossible. So maybe maybe there are templates for some things. Uh, this kind of works. This You start to see learning, memory, intelligence, overall vision. They all start to kind of like, you know, bleed together and work in, in harmony. But you know, in terms, I would imagine of building a model, it's like, yeah, that doesn't work. <laughs> yeah. And exactly. It's when you sit down and actually try to make it work that you're like, oh, okay. Yeah. That idea is okay, but it's not going <laughs> to explain everything. Right. Um, yeah. So, I mean, and so the way that we currently think about how vision works, it has a little bit of a template matching element in that basically the the main difference is that we think of the visual system much more as a hierarchy now where mm -hmm. you have at each stage you know starting at the retina itself and then there are various kind of steps along the way in the brain which is like the thalamus and the primary visual mm -hmm. cortex and mm -hmm. the secondary visual cortex and it goes on and so uh each of those steps are kind of doing their own transformation and looking for their own patterns in the visual input mm -hmm. um and so these are you can think of kind of the patterns that they're looking for as templates, but in the first stage in the retina, you know, you do have retinal cells that are looking for, there are certain retinal cells that respond to motion in different directions and that kind of thing. So these very like base level things that might be useful um, to how you want to understand the world. And then in the thalamus, you have neurons that respond to um, basically like dots of light. Like if mm -hmm. you have a dark area surrounded by bright or a bright area surrounded by dark, these kind of high contrast points. And then in uh, the primary visual cortex, you have cells that respond strongly when they there is like an edge or a line that has high contrast. Mm -hmm. And so um, in the uh, 60s, um, there were scientists who were studying um, the visual system in cats in particular, this was Hubel and Weasel, and they are the ones who kind of identified that the thalamus responds to these points of light, and then um, the primary visual cortex responds to these bars of light uh, at different orientations. Different cells have different orientations that they respond the most to, and they kind of realized like, oh, well, in order to end up with a cell that responds to um, a bar of light, it should just get input from the thalamus cells that respond to points of light, and it should get input from different cells that correspond to different points in a row. Because if you just put points in a row, you get a line. And so this was this idea that at each stage in this hierarchy, the one level is looking for specific patterns in the activity of the layer below. Um, and then there's this other component to it, which is that um, you don't want to be too nitpicky about where exactly the patterns are. So for example, in the um, neurons and primary visual cortex that respond to uh, an edge at a certain point in space, there are other cells that get input from those that respond to the same angle line, but they don't care if that uh, line is kind of in a broader region of space. They'll, they are forgiving of displacement of the line somewhat. 
-hmm. so that you can kind of survive things that aren't exactly as the the pattern you know what the pattern uh seekers are looking for and this um this just kind of repetition of uh, cells that look for patterns in the uh, area that comes before them, and then these cells that kind of are forgiving of uh, spatial uh, displacement. If you just kind of repeat that process over and over, you get a good approximation to what these different brain areas in the, the visual system do. Like they're just kind of repeating this process. And by doing that, you go from cells that respond to points and lines to cells that respond to shapes and eventually complex objects and faces and all these things. And you just have to build it up in this hierarchy. Um, so that was the original finding about primary visual cortex and um, its inputs. That was Hubel and Weasel in, in the 60s. Um, but that got translated into a computational model in uh, the late 70s. Um, by Fukushima, and he heard about it. This is like one of the things that I find most fun about kind of cross-disciplinary fields is that uh, this was a guy who was working at the um, National Broadcasting Center in uh, Tokyo, and he was an engineer there, but the Broadcasting Center hired people who were like psychologists and physiologists and stuff um, to study, you know, how humans take in signals. And so they had a meeting where someone on the neuroscience side talked about this Hubel and Weasel finding, and this guy heard about it as an engineer and thought, okay, I'll try to make like an artificial visual system based on this idea, um, which is like just as a direct translation, which is just like, it's a really cool, um, it's just a cool demonstration of what happens when you get people from different fields uh, together nice. and have them, you know, test out each other's ideas basically absolutely yeah i think that that's uh, kind of what the, the the model you were talking about is it kind of sounds like a like a progressive assembly line right mm -hmm. it's just kind of like you do this and then you do do this part and then you build off of that you do that and so and then and then you get engineering into it and it's like wow like you know you just have a whole not a grid but a whole different way of understanding like how this works and what were his major findings about it? Did he create the artificial kind of visual system? And what were the biggest things that he concluded? Yeah, so one of the interesting things is that when he made this, um, he only had known about this finding about the primary visual area. And so he built kind of a model that was replicating that. And then he wanted to know like, okay, where does that information go then? What comes after the primary visual area and what should those cells respond to and what should I do from then on? Um, but that's not what was then studied by Hubel and Weasel. They, they didn't continue to characterize the properties all down the, um, the visual system. Mm -hmm. And so it was his kind of intuition to say, oh, I'll just repeat this process. I'll just assume that later areas do the same thing mm -hmm. to the area before them. Mm -hmm. And then, then I can get like, um, a multi-layer model of the visual system. And so that's what he did. And, uh, really the kind of major kind of quite major and huge um, descendant of this model is convolutional neural networks, which are basically the same basic structure as this neocognitron model, which is what Fukushima made um, mm. in the late 70s. It's basically the same idea, um, but people have made them bigger and bigger and trained them on more data, and they are now the model that powers kind of all of artificial vision. So mm. when, you know, social media sites can auto generate a caption for a figure or label a face in an image or self-driving cars analyzing a visual scene. These are all using convolutional neural networks, which come directly out of this neocognitron model, which is itself a direct implementation of uh, what was happening in, in uh, observed in the brain. And then, as I said, this interaction in the vision field is just like constant back and forth um, because convolutional neural networks are now also one of, if not the leading model that we have for how biological vision works. Like I study vision as my in my job as a computational neuroscientist, and I use convolutional neural model, neural networks as a model of the visual system. And I try to understand how the brain's visual processing works by building these models so that I can play with, you know, visual processing in a simulation. It's it's absolutely incredible. I mean, it's just really just hearing it and reading it, it's just it's so it's so incredible. Um so just kind of tell us, I mean, I, I won't expect you to, you know, give us the brief version of the Bayesian model and some of the other artificial neural networks, but 
just kind of tell us, you've kind of started to, to hint at it there. You know, a lot of your book is a lot of history. It's a lot of narratives about, okay, we understand a lot of things about neuroscience and the brain. And there was a lot of people before that were doing this stuff in the 30s and 50s and 60s and 80s and even 90s until today. Looking towards the future, where do we, we see or continue to see this continuous overlapping of um, math and physics and engineering with you know neuroscience and everything else? What, what do we have to look forward to? Um, obviously, we have things like um, uh, automation and, and AI and many things, you know, you know Elon Musk has the, 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 the Neuralink, you know, there's many things that are going on. How do you, what are your ideas about prospects for the future of what we're, what's on the horizon and what are potentials of things that are pretty cool that we could be doing with understanding these kind of interactions with the two fields or, or various fields rather? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So you mentioned um, Bayesian models. So I can talk a little bit about that and maybe where where the future of that leads. Yeah, yeah. Um, so these are models of um, frequently they're kind of models of perception, not even at the neural level, just as kind of a, a psychological model to explain behavior and to explain how people integrate uh, sensory inputs. Um, but they're based on Bayes rule, which is just like a, a rule in statistics and probability. Um, and kind of the main components of um, this uh, approach to understanding the brain that makes it different from uh, other approaches is one that in Bayes rule, you basically have two terms that tell you how you should come to a conclusion, say about like what you're looking at. So if you imagine that you're kind of looking at a scene that is maybe difficult to make sense of or something like that. One example we can use is the Necker cube, which I'm sure a lot of people have seen. It's just like when you draw a cube, a three-dimensional cube on a two-dimensional piece of paper, the fact that you can see it is either popping out at you or going into the page. Um, so if we think about something like that, you know, you have input that's coming into your eyes. Uh, and uh, in the Bayesian model, this is called the likelihood. This is information that represents kind of what, what you're getting at the moment. And Bayes' rule says that you, to come to a conclusion about what you're looking at, you should combine that information with a prior, which is information that you just kind of have about the statistics of the world, about what's more likely and what's less likely, just generally not based on this particular moment. And so by combining those things, it explains how um, we can sometimes have illusions of a certain kind that are based on what is normally true in the world. So you, if you imagine that you lived in a world where cubes were normally coming towards you, um, and then when you looked at a Necker cube, you would probably see it coming towards you rather than going into the page. Um, and there's some so, element of depth perception in that as well, correct? Yeah, yeah. So this is kind of, this is, would be interplaying with your, your depth perception system. And so the idea here is that for whatever reason, your depth perception system would be biased towards seeing things a certain way, presumably based on your past experience in, in the world. That's where the priors are supposed to come from, either through evolution, like they're encoded in your genes and your brain is built mm -hmm. a certain way to have certain priors, or through your own personal experience and development. Sure. Sure. Um, yeah, but so the main, so that is one major component of the Bayesian approach to studying the brain, which is that you have this prior, which says that you're not just processing information that you're getting in that moment. You're combining it with information from the past, basically. Mm -hmm. Um, and then the other component to the Bayesian approach is that it's probabilistic. So it's saying that you don't just kind of think one thing, you actually have a probability distribution that says maybe the cube is, you know, uh, seventy percent coming out towards me and thirty percent going into the to mm. the page is kind of how you can think about it. Um, and so these are like there's a lot of good reasons to use a prior and to use probability distributions rather than just having like a single thing that you either believe or don't believe to actually have kind of um, a sense of almost how certain you are in different beliefs. Um, and so people people a lot of people test whether, you know, the brain really does do some sort of Bayesian um, processing by showing people, you know, ambiguous stimuli or showing them information that comes into two different senses and seeing how they integrate it. There's a lot of different ways to test out if people are doing something that's Bayes-like. Um, and so that's a big field of research. And then people are also interested 
you know, if there's an area where they establish that, yes, it does seem like people are using Bayes' rule here, the question is how do neurons actually implement that? Because mm. a lot of the way that we think mm. about neurons and our computational models don't actually address how a probability distribution would be encoded in neurons. That's like a mathematical concept that you have to find some way to put onto the activity of, of neurons. Mm. Um, and also there's the question of where is the prior in the brain? Like how mm. does the brain have a prior sorted? Is it that the connections between neurons are such that they bias you towards one conclusion or another and that's where a prior is? Or you know, where else can a prior come in? So those are kind of open areas that people have been excited about. This has been you know an area of interest, I would say pretty strongly since the 90s. Um, and then also people in AI have been interested in, in Bayesian approaches for a long time because, again, they believe that it's a good thing to do. It's like the statistically optimal thing to do is to combine your information with a prior and do so in a, in a probabilistic sense. Um, so there's people who are really trying to push AI more in the direction of using um, Bayes rule type things, which is not the current uh, dominant approach, as I said convolutional neural networks are like the dominant approach, approach for vision. And those are artificial neural networks, um, which don't usually explicitly deal with probabilities of any kind. Um, and so there's this push to kind of maybe merge those two things to make artificial neural networks that do more of Bayesian computations and probabilistic approaches and that kind of thing. Um, so yeah, isn't, I think that isn't, isn't, sorry, isn't that just kind of like a, I can see the utility of it. It's, it's, it's again, deeply fascinating, but isn't it more of like a, chicken or the egg kind of thing in what it's way? like so in, if we don't know the priors we don't know the priors are genetically based or biologically based or they're environmentally based or some combination of the two i, I don't know if we'll ever know those things right i mean how could we there are ways to study it so people in animals at least can change the environment that the animal is raised in and see if they still kind of show behavior that suggests that they have a certain prior. Um, so I think they did this with chickens, uh, which is that, so a lot of the ways that we interpret a visual scene, we are assuming that light comes from above. Like if mm -hmm. you probe people, like, how do you interpret this scene? Uh, like is the box inverted or um, based on shadows and stuff, mm -hmm. um, then people will say, answers that are consistent with them assuming a light source that comes from above. And uh, I think there was an experiment where they raised chickens in a world where the light always came from below and showed that they could actually change their prior such that they now behaved in a way that it, they believed that the light source was coming from below when they were interpreting scenes. So there are some things you can do to play around with it. Obviously, a lot less than you can do in humans. Uh, yeah. If you're using animals, you can do more. But yeah. Oh, no. I mean, that that again, that sounds very promising. That's very interesting. So... Yeah. Yeah. I, I, um, the, the, the skeptic in me is always interested about that. Sure. Um, but yes, I know a lot of people get excited about that model. And so it's, uh, I've, I've heard lots about it. And so it's, just, it's, it's cool to see that that's where it's at. And, um, any, anything else about the, the future of, of neuroscience and using mathematical models. And as we look, you know, 10, 20, 50 years from now, you know, potentially where, where are we headed or where are we going with that? Yeah, so I mentioned that kind of artificial neural networks are what people use for AI now. And these are networks that, as their name suggests, are inspired by how neurons work. Basically, they're made up of a bunch of neuron-like units, very, very simplified neuron models, much simpler than like the Hodgkin-Huxley one that I talked about that makes an action, action potential. Mm -hmm. So very, very simplified models of how neurons behave. Um, but the idea is you can connect them all up and train them to be good on stuff, and it works <laughs> for the most part. Um, so that's what's being used for a lot of artificial intelligence now. Um, but uh, and so within neuroscience, that fact has gotten mixed reactions. Uh, some people like me are excited because this means that we can build models that are brain like in the sense that they use neurons to do things mm -hmm. and they can actually like do interesting things like process images and tell us what's in them or, um, you know, play games or whatever you want to train an AI to do. You know, historically in computational neuroscience, it's been hard to build models that actually do things that, that mimic the brain's behavior. We can build <laughs> models that do very, very simple um, computations with neurons, but getting models that can do complex, high dimensional, real world computations with neurons has been hard. And like, if we could do that, then we would also be solving AI, obviously. Um, so computational neuroscience has not been able to do that very widely. 
Um, so for me, being able to build a model that is brain-like and can actually do things and then gives me like a system to study to say, okay, how does this computation get done by neurons? Um, that's very exciting to me. So I'm very interested in using these artificial neural networks as models for understanding the brain and as ways of kind of practicing how to understand the brain. <laughs> like, you know, try to understand this model first and then see if you can understand the brain. Mm -hmm. Um, but uh, so right now, the dominant way that those um, neurons get connected up, like how you know how strong the connection between different neurons in these artificial neural networks should be, is through an alg algorithm called backpropagation, which uh, is very mathematically simple. It just says, like, you know, if you want the output of the network to be something, just do this calculation and it'll tell you how to change all the weights in the network to make the output more like what you want it to be. Mm. Um, so it works very well, but it's not considered biologically plausible in the sense that like, we don't see how the brain could just calculate backwards th through all its connections. Mm. Um, as I said, kind of the dominant idea of how the brain learns is through heavy and learning, which is about just the relationship between two neurons that are interacting with each other. Mm -hmm. And so getting information from far, far away areas uh, into the interaction between two neurons much earlier is considered very challenging. Hmm. Um, so yeah, so this is an area where people are excited to kind of think about how the brain could be doing backpropagation or what the brain's equivalent of backpropagation is, because obviously the brain is very good at learning how to do things. So it's doing something and it's not just doing the simple Hebbian style learning that we mostly think about. It's doing something more complicated and more interesting. And if we could figure that out, it would be really cool. Um, and I just think the, the success of backpropagation in artificial neural networks has really um, invigorated the field of uh, learning in computational neuroscience and, and how can you make models that can actually learn to do real tasks uh, using mechanisms that we believe that real neurons could do. Again, it's absolutely fascinating. And you can, I can already think about all the ways that that would be so helpful and so useful for us as humans and how we could understand things and, you know, figure out when the brain breaks down and when we have all these problems and that you could just automatically think about all the, all the potential uses for it in a, in a positive way. So that's super exciting. Um, okay. I want to be respectful of your time. Um, tell us where uh, we can find you, um, mm -hmm. you know, when your book comes out, where we can get it and any of your other research and where you are online or websites, or just tell us the best places to, to find you. Sure. Yeah. Um, so I'm pretty on Twitter <laughs> for better or worse. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's at neuro grace. Um, and you can go to my website, which is just grace w Um, and yeah, so there I have, past blog posts and links to um, papers and stuff like that. I mean, for um, a general obvi audience, obviously the book is kind of the, the best thing to go to. And so that's Models of the Mind, How Physics, Engineering, and Mathematics Have Shaped Our Understanding of the Brain. It is already out in the UK and India and kind of in Europe, but Brexit has made shipping to Europe complicated. But <laughs> I know people in Europe who have gotten it. Um, it's coming out in the U.S. on May 4th. Uh, and you can get it from uh, the publisher website, Bloomsbury, or the normal ways that you get books. There's also an ebook version, and there uh, will be an audiobook version, which uh, thankfully I did not have to read. <laughs> uh, oh, I was going to say, are you reading it? or No, no. There's no? a lot of words in my book I don't know how to pronounce, so it's for the best. <laughs> Um, but Very yeah, funny. so yeah, you can get the book in all the normal places and yeah, for people who maybe are a little more in the weeds and want a little bit more nerdy detail. Um, as I said, I used to have a podcast called unsupervised thinking, um, but the episodes were not timely. So if you're interested in certain topics in neuroscience, you can look at the back catalog. We have like 50 episodes on different topics, mostly related to computational neuroscience. Uh, so I would point people to that as well. That's great. I, I, of course, will put all this in the notes. Um, I can't say enough nice things about you and your work, Grace. You're, you're quite lovely, super brilliant. I learned a lot from reading your book and talking to you. And it's, uh, you know, an absolute blast. I really appreciate you coming on and, and talking to me. And hopefully listeners really learn a lot and get a lot out of it. So I can't thank you enough for your invaluable work. Thank you. This was really fun. All righty. Thank you. <laughs>